If you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to, uh, to Matthew chapter 21. Um, your notes today are kind of minimal here, so it does give you the reference, okay? But the main thing that I want you to do with this sheet, I think probably the verses will be on PowerPoint, so if you don't have your Bible app with you or a Bible with you, uh, you'll probably be able to follow along in PowerPoint. But if you do have your Bible with you, I'd like to encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter 21. And, uh, and then there'll be a few things that we share that you might want to just take a minute to jot down um, on, your, uh, on your handout uh, that, that you do have. So we left you space for that. Um, this uh, reading of the scripture has to do with Jesus uh, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey where he, uh, what we call Palm Sunday. And uh, Palm Sunday is the beginning of the end for Jesus as far as his earthly ministry. And uh, in looking at this, I, typically speaking on uh, Palm Sunday, I've endeavored to take some kind of a, something from the story of Palm Sunday itself and share that. I'm going to do that today, but I'm also going to draw a little bigger picture, uh, look at, at a little wider scope as well, and encourage you. I'm going to say that today is more of a launching pad for your Holy Work Week celebrations than it is even just a message in and of itself. It's a time for us to really enter into uh, what it is that Jesus came to do and, and, and the impact that that had on the world of that time and still is having on our world today and what God wants to have in your life through this. And so it struck me as I was reading through this and looking at this, it struck me that Matthew is a book of 28 chapters. And here we begin in, in, in chapter 21 where Jesus is entering into his final week on this earth. And it struck me that one-fourth of the book of Matthew is dedicated to Jesus' life, one week of his life. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, wow, that, I mean, obviously we already know this is a very important week. But sometimes you maybe have just been reading through and you maybe read something that Jesus taught because he did teach quite a bit actually in this time period. And, uh, and there were a lot of situations that occurred and a lot of stories. I mean, you just page through, you'll see a lot of red letters. If you have a red letter Bible, a lot of red letters through this section. So Jesus did a lot of teaching, a lot of talking, a lot of interacting. And so his words are recorded. A lot of things he said in this last week. And I'm thinking, well, this, this last week was something that Matthew decided when he was writing this book. That I'm going to put a big focus on this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to really go into some detail here, and I'm going to lay out some things that happened this last week. And uh, and what struck me was that there have been sometimes, you know, just in uh, you know looking at different scriptures or things like that, that I've pulled something maybe from chapter 23 and chapter 24, and kind of talked about it and thought about it and focused on it, and sometimes have forgotten. Those were words, that was a story Jesus told. Those were words he shared in his final week on this earth. Now, I, I, I thought of different titles, actually, um, for the message, and, uh, and, but I ended up with a, with a statement, what a week, what a week. How many of you have ever had a year, that year? You know, that year? You ever had a, that year? Now, I'd like to ask this, but I'm afraid to because you're probably not going to admit it anyway. Have you ever had two of that year? You know, two years of that year? You know, sometimes you feel like, hey, I had that year. Uh, my quote is full. That's it. I'm done. And then you realize, well, you had another one somewhere along the way. Have you ever had one of those days? Ever had one of those days? Anybody had one of those days? And, uh, and, and you know, ever had a week like that? Man, just a week like that. That's just like crazy. We, we most, we have, we've, experience those things and sometimes we'll look at it and we'll go well i'm glad that day's over or sometimes you hit the end of a year and you're going i'm really ready for a fresh new year i mean i need a clean page i need to start over i need something and so we we are aware of that i'm just going to tell you in this situation i'm not th this when we say what a week it, it it can really have a lot of meanings it's not just like what a week in a sense how terrible it was there were terrible things that happened but there were amazing things that happened and the may and what makes this week this week would be one of the saddest stories ever told if it wasn't for what we celebrate next week in the resurrection of jesus it would be a tremendously sad story because jesus would just be another prophet he'd be just another good guy he'd be just another person who said a lot of wise things and then he died 
and we can just remember him from that and there would be no hope for something beyond this life but because jesus lived and because he lived this week and because he was willing to go through the events of this week and because he was willing to die be buried and rise again we have it's a different kind of hope it's a different kind of outlook and there's no religion and there's no philosophy there's no trend of thought that that can equal the opportunity that jesus gave us by being raised from the dead and demonstrating he has power that gives us something for this life he gives us eternal life in this life which changes the whole purpose and meaning of our life and yet whenever we die it's really just the beginning and so what a, what a what a week what a week and i'm hoping you'll journey through this week with me and we're going to start right now with looking at uh, chapter 21 at verse 1 and i'm going to read through the uh, his triumphal entry into into jerusalem as they approached jerusalem and came to bethage on the mount of olives jesus sent two disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you say that the lord needs them and he will send them right away jesus always intrigues me it seems like to me he's not a, he, he is not drama oriented in the sense we typically think of drama we typically think of people who are drama oriented as people who stir things up a little bit just for the sake of stirring them up I, I, I don't always know why, Je I can't always figure out why Jesus handled things the way he handled them. But it, mu it amuses me, for one. And it also, uh, it gives me, a, it, it, I don't know, it just gives me this perspective sometimes. Here in this situation, I'm thinking as I read through this several times this week, and I, 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 I kept thinking about this. And so sometimes when I keep thinking about something, I share it. It's not this is the great spiritual truth of the morning, but it does, I, I hope it helps you gain a little bit of insight into making the bible interesting when you read it you know if you just read it and just kind of kind of glaze through it i feel like we miss stuff but whenever we're looking and going what if I, what if i was right there at that time what if i'd have been one of the disciples and jesus had told me this would i have just done what they did just go get the donkeys and you know and um and and, and head on over there like 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 jesus told me to or would i have done something like this would i have said Jesus, well, if they're going to give permission for us to have the donkeys, wh why don't we just go ask them permission in the first place so we don't get shot or something, you know, or give the impression that we're trying to steal their donkeys? I have no idea why Jesus decided in this setting to go, it'd be better for you to ask forgiveness than permission. I don't know. But it intrigues me, and Jesus knew that these people were going to cooperate, and he already laid it out there. And so I, as I'm reading through, I'm just thinking, I, I try to understand what test was Jesus putting people to? You say, does God test people? Sure he does. What test? What test was he putting? Was he putting his disciples to a test? Whether they would have just obedience, just do what he told them to do, not question it? Was he putting the people who owned the donkey to the test? That they would, they would have the right response and, and, and once they understood and knew that they would never respond, you know, don't think that some things that happen in your life aren't God testing you. This is just a little side thing, very much a little side thing. And, and, and I think sometimes we're taken off guard with the fact that God might test us sometimes. Uh, have you ever had a situation happen to you and you just kind of shake your you know, head when you're done going, why did that? You know, I'm walking into Walmart and this person walks up to me and asks for your money. And you can just cast that off as something like, you know, go get a job. Or you can just go, you know, why, I'm, why, did, why did they pick on me? You, you can look at all kinds of ways. Or you can say, I wonder what God wants me to do in this situation. Did he just, did he send them to get a donkey? Or did, no, I'm just kidding about that. But did he, did he you know, did, was that a God appointment? Was that something that... I should pay attention to in some way and there's something here that god wants me to do or say or respond i think too easily we brush off things and i think god is saying hey i'm just you know how how many of these uh 
quizzes are you going to fail you know and in this this case it doesn't become much of a drama because exactly what he said happened and uh but i but i'm intrigued by the approach jesus uses and so so don't think that if something is unique or a little bit out of the ordinary that god isn't sometimes at work because oftentimes that's how he works through ways we wouldn't think he would work we would do it this way I mean, I don't know how many conversations I've had with God trying to help him see the, how to do it the right way. I mean, sometimes he's a little bit hard-headed. He's like, he doesn't get it. He doesn't, think, he doesn't think my way is the right way. There's been many times I've had those conversations, and I'd like to say I'll never have another one. I'm just going to have simple obedience every time he tells me I'll just do it. The truth is that oftentimes we think our way is the right way. And so here in this situation, Jesus asked him to do something that seemed unique, they did it, worked out, but I just wanted to highlight that as we pass through. Sorry if that um, not to belabor it. Let's go on to verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, saying to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So it, the, the idea of him having a donkey and riding in a donkey was the fulfillment of Scripture. And I want to take us to that for just a moment and say this. Everything that Jesus did as he lived his life, as he went into this Holy Week, as he experienced this Holy Week, many of the things that occurred were actually fulfilling the prophecies that were made about him. And, you know, there are over 300 and some prophecies in the Bible about Jesus. And uh, those who have done research and researched each of those very carefully have found that all of those came through. And the chances of that are better for you, you know, to, to, to uh, win the lottery, you know, 25 times or more than that happening. And, uh, and, and it just, it just it doesn't add up. There's no way almost one person could fulfill all of that if it wasn't God having had his hand involved in that. And so the part of the miracle of Jesus and part of the miracle of his story is how he fulfilled prophecies of, of, of that had been told about him hundreds and even thousands of years prior uh, to his coming. And so this is a fulfillment of that. Jesus, uh, in verse 6, says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. And part of what they're saying is Hosanna, some of it is a praise and so on, is save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so I want to pause here for a moment and just talk about kind of the 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 dynamics of what were going on. Jesus had been in Jerusalem before, and as you'll see at the end of the passage we're going to read here, he left Jerusalem that day, went outside of Jerusalem uh, to Bethany and, uh, and spent the night there, came back in to Jerusalem the next day. So he had entered Jerusalem many, many times over his uh, earthly ministry. What was different about this? What was different about this was he was entering Jerusalem with a public demonstration that he was coming as a humble king. Thus the donkey, thus him riding that donkey, thus the disciples laying their cloaks on the donkey and then spreading clothes across. It was a red carpet experience, only it was made up of the clothes of those who loved him and who were following him. And, uh, and, and then, you know, obviously they took branches and they were waving the branches as Jesus came in. And they were, you know, shouting praises and they were shouting for him to save them. And, you know, uh, Jerusalem, Israel was under the domination of the Roman Empire at this time. And so there was a great cry in the people's hearts to want to be delivered politically. And so a lot of people were looking at Jesus as a political deliverer, as one who would come and set them free from the dominion as an earthly king who would take over. That's the reason why Herod was threatened by him when he was referred to as a king as a baby. Uh, that's, that's, that's the reason why, um, the, the, and ultimately the uh, Pharisees and all those 
were threatened by him from a religious standpoint because people believed in him in a different way than they believed in the system that the Pharisees promoted. And so what I would uh, what I'd like to just kind of show you here is that you have people who are praising him, honoring him. Some of them are doing it because um, they really have believed in him and they believe that he is the Messiah. He is the one who has come to, to save his people from their sins. Others are looking for political deliverance and they're saying, hey, this guy could do things we've never seen anybody else do. We believe he can take them down. We believe he can lead us to victory. We believe he can set us free. And so some of them were, were allotting him because of uh, political opportunity. Others, I'm sure, just like in any crowd, were just, you know, it was, life could be boring for people sometimes. This is exciting. And so they just joined in the excitement. They just came out and were a part of it uh, just because they were, you know, they, 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 they became a part of the crowd. And, uh, and that, was, that was fun. That was exciting for them. There were other people in the city who heard this going on and said, what in the world is going on? What's happening here? Now, Jesus is entering as a king. But I think who that king was and what he was was undefined for a lot of people. They were accepting him. They were embracing him. They were praising him. They were honoring him. They were welcoming him. And then there were people who said, who is it? We don't know even who it is. What's going on here? And so there were people who were confused by what was going on. And the people who answered him said, he's a prophet. Was that a good thing for Jesus to be considered a prophet? Absolutely. But he was a whole lot more than a prophet. So there were people who saw him as another Elijah, uh, as, a, as, as one like that, who had come as a redeemer to help, help, help them uh, be set free. So you have all this variety of people. And, and here, here's what I want to tell you, and that is today, even right in this room right here, I think we have different, all of us can be at a different place in our, uh, in our understanding of who Jesus is and uh, what he came to do. And sometimes we can just look at, you know, honoring Jesus or, you know, going to church or being religious in some way. Is, it's a good thing. It's just a good thing to do. And so we want to be a part of that. For many others, for many of many here this morning, you've personally embraced Jesus as the king of your life. You said, I follow this king, Jesus. He is my king personally. He's the Lord of my life. He's the king that I follow. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to obey what he says. I'm going to follow in his ways. And then there are others that may be curious, maybe trying to understand. And so there's a variety, not only here, but just in our world. And then there are people, as you'll see in the story, who rejected him outright, absolutely rejected him, literally hated him, and obviously at the end of the week put him to death. And there are people in our world today who literally despise the name of Jesus and are not open to the name of Jesus. It's offensive to them if his name is mentioned. Um, and, and if someone prays in the name of Jesus, that's offensive. And they'll want to raise a, a, you know, a big issue about it. And, and there are those who would like to stamp out his influence today, even today. So a lot of what we see in the context of this week still exists in our world. And so really ultimately it comes down to a question, who is Jesus to you? In this week, as you look at who Jesus portrayed himself to be and who he represented, how he represented God to man and the process that he went through, really ultimately at the end of the day, the question we have to answer is, who do I believe this Jesus is? Who do I believe that he is? And who have I made him in my life? Now let's go on a little further in our reading. It says this, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Here it is. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, it feels like to me, as you know, you're looking at the context of this and this is coming in, You've heard Jesus say some pretty stiff things along the way. Sometimes he would, in his conversations with the Pharisees, he would kind of speak pretty plainly to them. Um, and in and, and a point that, you know, they were offended, they took offense to it. Um, but it seems like to me as Jesus is coming into this final week of his life on earth, as I was reading through this, I thought, I think there's a few things he wants to clear up. Yes, he's come basically to lay his life down as a ransom 
for our sins, to take our place on the cross. He has done that. And, and he's going to do that this week. But, but he wanted to set the record straight on a few things. And there was sort of a boldness to it that, you, that not that he wasn't bold before, but that, that really stands out. I mean, can you imagine walking in to a sacred place like the temple courts and just starting to flip tables over? You know, um, and, and he also, it says that he, um, he overturned the tables in the benches of those selling doves. Now, if any of the doves got freed up, the Peta people came, you know, anyway, you know, I'm just, that's a joke. But anyway, that's, uh, I mean, he was really in trouble now, folks. He messed with the, he messed with the, the animals. Um, but, but, you know, the, the message that he made, there's, there's all kinds of things that we can take from it. But I think the main message that I take from this is this, and that is, it's really easy to ca get caught up in religious practices and doing things the way we want to do them and forgetting the entire reason why we ever even come to church, why we ever have faith, why we ever open the Bible. And it's all about a relationship with God. What is prayer? Prayer is about us talking to God. It's about a relationship with God. You know, if you, if, if you were to say to me, if I were to talk to you and you say, you know, I haven't talked to my brother in 20 years. You know what I would know immediately? There's probably some difficulty there in the past. And you don't have a relationship with that brother. You don't have a relationship. And uh, so if you don't ever pray, you know, if you tell me you haven't prayed in 20 years, I'm going to go, can I help you get acquainted with God? I think you need to get acquainted with God. So prayer isn't just even, you know, sometimes we, we, prayer at the essence of it is us communicating, us interacting with God, having a conversation with God that's at the core of it. And so it's this, and so Jesus is saying, you're, you're coming in here and doing all this exchanging of business. You're, you're going through the process of even selling stuff for people to come and sacrifice. You don't even know why you're here. You don't even know why you're here. It's about a relationship with God. And you guys are distracting people away from this. You've just turned it into a business operation. And I'm going to tell you, it's been true of all time. It's true today. There are people who will take advantage of religion and Christianity and everything else and turn it into some kind of a business for themselves. And God is never pleased with that because it distracts away from what it is. The purpose is behind it. The purpose is for us to be connected to God. It's not to promote ourselves or our goods it's not even to promote our organization. It is to promote people having a living relationship with a living God. And Jesus, Jesus is coming to make that connection for people. And sometimes people think it's just mad because he was selling stuff. It's because they had all lost their entire focus about what it meant to have a relationship with a living God. And I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be selling stuff in the church or that kind of thing for that to happen. That can happen for anybody at any time to just end up becoming ritualistic and go through the routines, go through, the, you know, have, it's a good habit to go to church, but the real point behind it is to have a connection with the living God. Connection. And so Jesus said, this is, you know, you just turned it into a den of robbers. This is to be called a house of prayer, a place where people connect with the living God. Now let's go on to verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and I love how Matthew says this, okay? When, when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant. Do, do you ever get mad at people for doing good things? Jesus was healing people. Tick them off. Man, why don't you just stay blind, you know? You're making us look bad. You're making him look good. You know, why don't you just stay crippled? I mean, they weren't celebrating these things. They were mad about it. They were mad this was happening. They were ticked off. They were indignant. And to hear the little children going around praising the Lord. My goodness. Tick them off. 
And he says, they said, do you, do you hear what these children are saying? They ask him. Yes, replied Jesus. Yeah, I actually did happen to hear it. Um, I, I did. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And you remember in another gospel, whenever the Pharisees approached him as he was entered into Jerusalem, rightly on his way in, and, he, and, the, and they came up to him and said, quiet these people down. Now, I don't know these two different incidents or just the way these guys describe the same incident, but they, they said, quiet these, quiet these people down. Just get them to be quiet. You hear what they're doing? And Jesus said, you know, I really would do that, but the problem is, see these rocks over here on the side? They're going to start hollering. He said, I don't, I, you know, and, and so I, it's not, I'm not, I can't stop praise. I can't stop. Because see, he was coming as our redeemer. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he was entering in to make an eternal difference for humankind for all time. And, uh, and so Jesus just reminded them that the scripture had said this thing would happen, this kind of thing would happen. And then he left them, went out of the city of Bethany, where he spent the night. Now, this is where I want to turn the corner a little bit to the broader scheme. And that is this. As I've read through this, and I, I tried to think of some way to, to make it into a, an actual sermon, but I think I want to have you help me out with this, okay? I know we're doing the Proverbs, or many of you are doing the Proverbs a day, but Holy Week only comes once a year. And, uh, and it struck me, and, and in our prayer time last night, Brandon and I were talking a little bit about this, and he was actually already thinking of this himself too, so it just felt like a confirmation for what I had, um, had been leaning toward sh uh, sharing with you. And um, if you start today by reading chapter 21, now we've already read together down through verse 17. If you were to read today all of chapter 21, tomorrow, if you would read all of chapter 22 and do that throughout this week, then you'll land on this coming Sunday on chapter 28, which has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. And so it just works out this as in, in, in a kind of perfect timing kind of way for you to read through. Now, there's stories in here that you'll think, well, I, I thought we were talking about Jesus' final week. But he's just, you'll see how much teaching he did, how much interaction he did in this final week. It's also interesting because here's something that I was thinking about with regard to this, and it was has to do with last words. Sometimes we'll focus on the last words of Jesus on the cross, and those are powerful last words. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. What, what a powerful, powerful message from the cross. And then when he said it is finished. I mean, those words are, they will ring for all of eternity as some of the greatest statements ever made from the greatest man who ever lived, who was a God man and who redeemed his people and rescued them uh, from, eternal, from eternal isolation from God. What, what, a, what, a, what a wonderful statement. But here's what I noticed was, Jesus had a lot of things to say in his last week on earth. What a week. What a week it was. And whenever people, and so I really started viewing the words that he spoke here in, this, in these chapters as his last words. Not just the few phrases on the cross, but these are his last words. This is what he's saying, before I leave this earth, before I'm gone, these are things I want to teach you. So you have to look at it in the context of what's imminent, what's coming, his death is coming. And some of the things, it puts a little bit of what I call flavor to his words. You know, my mother was, uh, she had pancreatic cancer in her last year, or she maybe had it, probably had it before then, but we found out a year before she passed away. It looked like she was going to go quickly when we found out, and we did, uh, we, we were able to have her do one more surgery that actually did prolong her life for a year. And uh, as a result of that, that year, and fortunately in her situation, uh, she did not suffer a lot of pain in that year. She was crippled from Parkinson's disease and, uh, and not highly mobile because of that, but she was not in a lot of pain. So she was very clear-headed, and she knew, we didn't know exactly how long, I think they'd said about six to nine months, she ended up 
stretching that into a year. And, uh, and, and so we had a year where we all knew that her life was coming to an end. Um, and, and yet she was very capable of communicating very clearly. And throughout that year, um, my mom made good use of that year and uh, spent time with people she loved. She lived with my oldest brother at that time and uh, had a pretty wide influence. And I could have said this before when I would be down there taking a week of duty for, to give my brother and sister-in-law some relief. Um, there would be a steady trail of people that would come through throughout the day. Um, some were students that had been under her in when she was a, a dorm mother at the college, at the Bible college. Uh, some of them were, were former students from that. Some of them were people from the church uh, where she attended, which was my brother's church there in South Florida. And, uh, and then just other people she had known over the years. It would just be a steady stream. There'd be people who had come back to that area. A lot of people come back and visit. They either grew up there or they went to school there or had attended church there. They would come back and they would from, be from out of town and come by and say, well, we're in town. We want to come by and see Mrs. Addison. And so it'd just be just a steady stream. And she'd just spend a little time talking to them and they'd go back to her room. And it was a, it was a great thing. And, uh, but I, and so it was, it was, it was actually a year of celebration, much more than a year of being morbid or things like that. And, you know, I think I talked to her almost every day on the phone during that year. You know, you know, time's not your friend in this point. Um, but I remember as it came down to her last few weeks, she became a little bit more intentional in who she wanted to talk to. And there were a few times whenever my siblings and I might, maybe our spouses too, maybe some of our kids would be gathered around her bed and, uh, and it felt like that in those moments, sometimes she would see who was there and she would think, this is a good time for me to say this. And so she would speak to us. One of the things that she had said after my dad had passed away, um, when she was 30, uh, 36 years old as a young widow of five children, she said this. She said, I, 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 don't, I know I'm not going to be a, a perfect parent. I know I'm not going to. She set us kids down and talk to us. At times she goes, but I made a promise when I was standing by your dad's um, casket, I made a promise to him that with everything in me, I would endeavor to see that our family circle is unbroken in heaven. And uh, so there were a few times when we were gathered there that she would say, hey guys, could I just say something? Her voice was weaker. We had to lean in a little bit. And she would say, don't ever forget that promise that I made your dad, that I'd do everything I could with God's help to make sure our family circle was unbroken one day in heaven. See, those were last words she wanted to say because it mattered. They were important. I have an adult son who has not always walked on the right path. And uh, my mother has prayed diligently for him over the years. My older brother has a son um, that has also not walked on the right path for much of his, many of his years. And uh, as she came down to the her ending days, she asked us to leave and she asked for my son to come in. And she spent some time talking to him. I never, I don't know everything that she said, but I know her pretty well. And I'm pretty certain that she said the same thing to him that she said to us. And maybe if he was even in there before. I do know this, that when he came out, he was bawling like a baby. And after he was gone, she called in Jonathan, his cousin, and wanted to talk to him. And because he came out kind of in the same way, I'm pretty sure that she, out of deep love and compassion and care for those boys, young men, said to them, 
I made a promise to your papa that I would do everything with my power and his help to have an unbroken circle one day in heaven. And I'm counting on you being there. I don't want you to not be there. Be there. Now, there are two people that my son loves more than anybody else in the whole world. And that was my mom and Vanjie's mom. And probably these two ladies have prayed for him more than anyone else on the face of the earth either. So my mom wasn't offensive, but she was clear. And she had no problem with saying, guys, you understand what really matters, don't you? And she wasn't afraid to face death. She wasn't afraid. She went peacefully and uh, left behind a great heritage for her family. Jesus understood his time was limited. And so I, I want you, I, I, I shared that story. It's very personal to me, very meaningful to me. But I shared that story because I think I have a little glimpse of how much you mean to Jesus and of how much I mean to Jesus. And I think when Jesus came to this earth, his mission was this. I can almost picture this conversation going on between he and the Father. And when the Father laid out for him, this is what's going to happen. And we know that Jesus had in his humanity had some of these thoughts. Because of the garden, he did speak to the Father one more time before he was, and you'll read this in here. He spoke to the Father one more time and he said, have you figured out another way? Is there some other way this could happen rather than this, the plan A? Is plan A still the plan? And remember, he sweat as though it was drops of blood. You're talking about on a human level, a, a, a torturous moment of anxiety, and not in the sense of him being unwilling, but just the pressure of all of this coming on him and his appeal to the Father. And the Father saying, you know, we've not come up with another plan. This is it. And I picture Jesus, and I kind of think of a scripture in Hebrews, and I'll, you don't have to go over there. I'll just, it's just a brief scripture I'll read to you quickly. A scripture in Hebrews chapter 12, where it says something about Jesus and how he felt about this. It says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For the joy set before him. What was that joy? The joy that was set before him was the fact that the very people he died for would have the opportunity to have an unbroken circle in heaven with God forever. I can almost picture this conversation before Jesus came to earth and the Father's laying out the plan and Jesus saying to him, Father, with everything in me, I'll give myself, I'll literally lay down my life so that our family will be unbroken in heaven. I will go and I will do this so that we'll have an unbroken family in heaven. We'll get to spend eternity. These people, these people who are, the, who are the, the love of your life, remember, for God so loved the world. The people that you created in our image, these people that we've placed as the highest of all creation, these people that we've made to spend relationship with that's the reason why God came into the garden in the cool of the evening to spend time with Adam and Eve because he created people to be in relationship with him he goes I will go and I will do on this rescue mission and I'll give it my best I'll give it my all to the point of death to death itself so that we can have 
you and you and you and you be in that unbroken circle in heaven. God, in Christ, this final week, said some very powerful things. I beg you this week to read those words. Today, 21, tomorrow, 22, walk your way through this holy week, and let's do it together. Maybe you want to find somebody. I'm going to ask those who I'm doing Proverbs with to just let me insert in, and, uh, and Brandy and I already agreed to that ourselves, but the others, let me insert in something from this reading as well this week. If you want to do it with your spouse, do it with a son or a daughter, do it with a mother or father, do it with a friend. It, it defines somebody that you can just, just send a quick um, text out of a verse that struck you from that chapter each day just to help us stay focused on this as we go through Holy Week. God has some last words that he wants to speak to you and he wants to speak to me. Matthew took the time to record them for us. Let's open up and let's let him talk to us. And let's prepare our hearts for a celebration like none other next week when we come together to say he's alive. He is alive. He not only laid it down for us, but he rose up. And I'm just going to tell you, I cannot wait till next week to talk about the open doors that God has made for us through the resurrection and the throwing away of that stone. It is going to be a great day. We I uh, have have a number of number kid, neighbor kids in our our little area where in the area where we live. Just so happens over the last year or so, it just seems like people have moved in with a bunch of kids, and so we're just our front yard's full of kids most days these days. And uh, and uh, one of the one of the little girls has started coming to church for the last couple of months with our kids, and uh, and and another thing is so they started inviting all the kids. And uh, they went to another neighbor and invited them. And the parents said, no, we don't send our kids to church. We take them to church. But they hadn't been going to church. So guess what they did? They started going to church. They didn't come here, but they started going. I guess they had a church they used to go to, and they started going to church because they felt under conviction because our kids were saying, well, we'll take them to church. This girl is going to be baptized this next Sunday along with some others. Her whole family is going to be here this next Sunday. I want to encourage you, don't overlook the opportunities that God may give you right close up to you that you're not aware of and you're not thinking about. And, 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 it's, and don't make people projects or this. And I believe God always is open source. But this Easter is an excellent opportunity to invite somebody you know who does not go to church. Please, I, 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 I know this won't make us grow in the way some churches might grow and I'm not reflecting on that. But We've made it a practice always. Don't invite people to go to another church. Just please don't do that. That doesn't, that doesn't serve anybody well. We're about building the kingdom and advancing the kingdom. And the only way we can really do that is for people not to just encourage people to sheep shuffle. There's enough sheep shuffle there is in our culture as it is. We don't need to encourage that in any way. Um, what we need to do is invite people who do not have a church home. It doesn't mean they haven't had one in the past, but they don't currently have a church home. Invite those folks and if you have a chance, there's the invitation cards in the back to do that as well. And I, I, here's, here's, here's what I want to I leave you with, this thought. When you read these chapters this week, I want you to picture in your mind, maybe you had an experience somewhere along your life with a fam family member, a relative, a parent, like I did with my mom, or like my, a lot of my family members did with my mom where they had something very important that they spoke into your life in their last days, if they knew they had those days. I want you to kind of have that framework in mind. If you haven't, just borrow my story. But have that framework in mind. And what I want you to do is read these chapters looking for Jesus' last words to you. Not for someone else. And, you know... Not, not, not for other people, but for you. As See it as him gathering you around this week to go, I just have a few things, Rod, I need to tell you before I lay down my life. Listen, lean in a little closer. You need to understand these are the words I'm going to say. 
before I leave this earth. And I leave 